Good morning, everyone, and good local time to you if you don't happen to be on the Pacific time zone. Uh, today is Thursday, January 5th, two, it's 2017, which is makes me stutter to say, but this is the Kubernetes community meeting, which happens once a week. Uh, today's agenda is actually kind of light. I don't have a demo unless someone has something in their pocket right now and wants to share. I will go with no demo this t this today then. All right, we do have a demo scheduled up for next week, so we're good on that. And I also shared with uh, the group last week, I think, uh, a few weeks ago, prior to the holidays, that we are going to start doing a rotating hosting of this, uh, this meeting. So going forward, we will be using SIGLEADS for this, which is very awesome. You've been conscripted. All right, so let me find the topics. And I updated the document for our topics in order to give us an archive document, uh, which has the, the, all the meeting notes from 14, 15, and 16. And then now in our formerly 110 page long agenda, document it loads it's much shorter there's only the last couple of meetings of 16 and then the new meetings in 2017 so far all right so with no demo today and thank you Jason for jumping in and doing uh, notes let us talk about 1.6 and really because we have uh, we have the opportunity to build out the 1.6 release team and Dan Gillespie has written a lovely proposal about how to move forward and try to broaden the release team so that it isn't as dependent on Googlers. So Dan, do you want to jump in and talk a little bit about the proposal that we linked here? Yeah, totally. Uh, so basically it just goes over some of the roles. Um, and so I put together a doc that sort of replicates some of this stuff. So eventually this will go on to a PR alongside his doc. Um, but it sort of it enumerates the roles that I think could be useful during the release, and we've got some feedback on those, and some just some additional processes that um, mostly just from previous release managers, their comments that I put together, um, and some of the people who have worked on testing. So, awesome. And you have volunteered. The link is already in the notes and agenda, Joe. Um, and for everyone here, Dan has volunteered to be our release manager lead for the team uh, on 1.6. So we are now offering, uh, or actually asking for volunteers for some of the other roles that are <laughs> Josh is chatting to. Josh is saying, yay, Dan. So um, uh, Dan has volunteered to be the release manager lead for this and we will um, fill in more of the roles. So we're looking for volunteers. Um, is anybody on the line willing to volunteer for some of the roles? I'm happy again to help volunteer with um, uh, test issues and flakes. Awesome. So the same Dan? for me, I'm going to work on the, on the features and also have submitted a brief commit to, to, like, to redefine the role of the uh, release notes lead. So I'd like to extend a bit this role and I'm going to handle this role. I saw your PR on that. Thank you, Ihor. So we've got a team of three already. And I think there is a docs release uh, person that we're looking to get help with as well. And then we will need an engineer from inside Google absolutely on the team to make sure that we can facilitate the things that are still Google, Google um, limited. So if we don't get, I didn't see many of the Google team on here yet. Um, if we don't get an immediate uh, volunteer here, we will follow up and make sure there's someone um, from the Google side on there. But we've got Dan, we've got Ihor, and we've got Caleb as a, a starting point, which is awesome. Thank you all. This may be a very short meeting. Um, is there anything else about the 1.6 release or uh, planning or anything that anyone would like to discuss in that space? No. 
All right. Well, 1.6 uh, work continues. Uh, down in the notices section, I have um, the, uh, the PM group is going to meet approximately weekly for the next uh, for the next few weeks at least to go through 2017 planning, make a consolidated roadmap from the special interest groups, and also go through the retrospective action items and try and help push those out. Um, there also uh, is going to be a, com a discussion next week about using about how the contributor experience working group is using the um, using the GitHub projects in order to do more of the project management for varying portions of their work. So we'll get to see how that works. All right, so uh, on the topic of releases, uh, 1.5 community award nominations. So there was no one, the last two retrospectives have had one person called out over and over and over as really holding together the release. Um, and there wasn't particularly that, that one name that came up this time. So I am seeking community award nominations for, um, for and from the community to find out who people think um, did, went the extra mile in 1.5. So please send me nominations, and we will see where, where we end up with a, a 1.5 community award this time. I would like to be able to at least announce it when, um, when or at KubeCon Berlin or before, depending on our timing on all of that. So um, please send me nominations. Does anyone need more info on what that is or what the goal of it is? Does anyone want to nominate anyone right now? Um, I would nominate uh, Don Chen or and Saad. Ah, Don and Saad. Don for the last minute um, team co corralling of the, uh, the lockup. Well, uh, uh, certainly continuous uh, route corralling of people and the last minute heroics as well. Yep, okay. So Don and Saad, I will put into my list. Other nominations, more than welcome. And in the chat it says, if you all community people don't nominate someone, he will steal the award. This is uh, David Aronchik, so we have to quick nominate people. All right, uh, let's see, going back through the questions. Josh Berkus asking about Kub Admin. Is anybody on the call that can speak to Kube Admin? We will have to follow up on that one, Josh. All right. I'll dig up the, uh, I'll dig up the issues in a second, and uh, we're, we're focusing on sort of the bare minimum to get us to beta in 1.6. Um, it's going to take us, um, you know, ruthless prioritization there. So your favorite feature may not be on our cut list, but if you want to come help out on a uh, uh, cluster life cycle, <laughs> feel free to come join us. But I'll post that into the chat. I'll dig up the, the, right, uh, the right doc there. Thanks, awesome. Okay, so then back to my agenda. Specialist interest group updates. So Philip, I think I saw you there, and Fabiano? Maybe there's Philip? Yeah, I'm here. Awesome, you guys for SIG CLI has this awesome set of documents about the 2017 roadmap and the Q1 roadmap. So tell us more. All right, I'll share my screen here. Awesome. All right. <clears throat> um, so this is community meeting notes. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay, um, so we have uh, last last year, at the end of last year, we kind of put together the document and had a discussion around what our 2017 goals were, as well as our Q1 goals. And we found it useful to group logically things in the themes we were trying to tackle. Um, the themes have some overlap, that's, that's fine. But it's mainly to figure out, like, uh, from a strategic perspective, that we have broader objectives that we're trying to tackle. Uh, and so briefly, the ones we settled are, are user education. Uh, and this is around uh, 
we see a lot of times bugs or uh, issues or questions on Stack Overflow from people not fully understanding how tools, the CLI tools are supposed to be used. Uh, feature requests for things that are already supported uh, or that are supported by uh, other tools that can be used together with the CLI tools. So I think just um, making sure we have a holistic walkthrough of how all the pieces fit together is pretty important there. Uh, engineering velocity, uh, this piece is, <clears throat> there's a number of uh, different projects that fit into this, but it's essentially like how do we make sure that we don't get bogged down and how do we make sure that we enable other folks uh, that are trying to integrate with us to <clears throat> be productive. Uh, application lifecycle management is a theme that's, uh, this, is, this is one of the feature-based themes and it's really about and the core utility of what we view the control CLI about, and that's how do we take code that's developed from an end user and then make sure that their Kubernetes system is running it and everything's healthy and they're um, being a profitable business. And so <clears throat> that's actually, uh, there's a bunch of different components about that that you can think about in uh, while there is, yes, the like Kube control apply takes care of uh, shipping your configs to the system, there's a lot of other pieces like how do you structure configs and directories and how do you factor them so you don't have a bunch of duplication and config code and um, how would you, how do you handle uh, broader orchestrations that say this needs to be pushed before that and that sort of thing. So this is around holistically taking a look at all those pieces that fit together to make sure the end user um, has, <clears throat> is able to do those things. It may not involve us writing all of them, but it uh, means that we at least know what the solutions in place are and what other people are doing. If they're using JSONet or they're using something else, we want to make sure that it's well documented how those integrate and what, what the issues are there and what the alternatives are. Um, Extensibility, this is another kind of feature area theme. Uh, and this is, there's a lot of extensibility in the Kubernetes cluster itself with um, third party resources, federated API servers, and we wanna make sure that the CLI uh, makes all those extensions feel native. Uh, and then uh, Kube Control as a platform is about, uh, there's infrastructure within Kube Control that Folks, uh, we find folks using such as uh, authorization to talk to the uh, API server or how our commands are structured or even um, our flag naming conventions. So something really small, uh, but that would fall under this and we think is important is that like, the flag name conventions are consistent across all the CLI tools in the ecosystem, right? So is it dry run, is it dry dash run? These sorts of things, like you should be able to switch from one tool to another and make sure that you just know uh, how to use everything. So <clears throat> figuring out how to make uh, it feel like a consistent platform regardless of what CLI tool you're using. Uh, and then uh, there's some technical deck pieces. I think arguably these could fall under engineering velocity. Um, so I, I won't go through all of the items here uh, because uh, you know, anyone can just kind of take a look and um, go through them themselves and comment on the docs. Uh, I'll switch over to the ones that we focused on for Q1. Um, so here's a spreadsheet of kind of the stuff we'd like to see completed. Uh, the first ones are around user education, uh, better logical and grouping of commands. This is really about like how do we provide a um, information architecture for how the commands are set up. Right now we have a large set of two control commands and um, how do we group things so you are quickly directed away from the commands you don't want um, and towards the commands you do want to fulfill your uh, objectives. Uh, there's some commands that are poorly documented right now or completely undocumented so we should fill in those gaps. And then this uh, user-friendly reference documentation is something that I've been working on for a while and shown a number of prototypes too, and there's a PR for now, but that's just on the list. Um, from the engineering philosophy perspective, uh, we'd like to be able to factor out the uh, libraries so that 
other other Go programs can use them and embed them uh, without having to <clears throat> do a lot of weird stuff like um, <clears throat> redirect standard out to, to get the output from certain things and uh, set flag values. Uh, so there's a lot in application lifecycle. Uh, I think this is the again kind of the core use case that we view the control CLI tackling. Uh, and so the first is just do research to figure out what the processes and methodologies are for integrating coup control into um, <clears throat> our customers' workflows. Are they using Jenkins? How are they using coup control with Jenkins? How are they factoring their configs? These sorts of things. Uh, part two is there are things we know that don't work, that are broken. We have a list of <clears throat> bugs for apply that impact uh, our user's ability to rely on it. So we want to tackle the highest impact ones there. Um, we're going to do an audit of the existing resources, just where we're having issues that get filed and say this apply doesn't work with resource X. Um, and there are things that we could have discovered if we'd actually looked through and, and did a full audit. So just looking at all the resources and looking for the common issues we've seen in other resources. Um, making sure that it works with third-party resources and federated API. Uh, a small one is the diff. Uh, it would be really nice for uh, diff and dry run for apply so that people can see what's going on. Um, and then better support for the create set view commands, which are, we have some, but they're just not exhaustive. Um, ways to initialize configs and um, better, better client skew for client server version skew behavior. This is something we always try and um, maintain and we do test for, but uh, we're not always successful in getting 100% compatibility there. Um, so extension support, uh, we, want, we want to be able to support extensions to Kube control uh, so that th this is part of that native feeling for third-party resources, federated API resources. We'd like to have a design approved that we can implement uh, in a future quarter. And um, the same thing with UIs, we'd like to be able to have uh, the UI uh, support the same sort of native feeling that <clears throat> the CLI does. And then lastly, the, as a platform pieces, we want to reduce the dependency on Cobra, um, the coupling of Cobra uh, from the actual business logic behind running the commands. And move logic out of the client into the server to reduce that version skew issue we were talking about earlier. Um, and then the technical debt piece here is just to try and get a better handle on the incoming issues. We have a ton of issues in Kube Control right now, um, and it's it's it makes it <clears throat> hard to say like how many we're actually going to get completed and how many get done and have reliable metrics around that, and so. Um, putting together first, like maybe SLOs for how many how many issues we're going to leave open, um, and how many we're going to tackle, and how many P zero issues we're going to tolerate, and that sort of stuff, um, so that we ourselves know uh, what our focus should be if it's tackling open issues and bugs versus developing features. All right, are there any questions or comments? I'd love to understand just a quick snapshot of what the, the motivations are to move stuff from the client into the server. Um, that seems like that's not a slam dunk in my mind. There's some sort of pluses and minuses there. Yeah, totally. Um, so the, uh, sorry, it's definitely not a slam dunk. It's a lot of work. Uh, and so we have to look at which ones we want to move and which ones we don't want to move. One of the motivating factors is that um, upgrading the, so there's the CLI and the server have um, expectations around how the other one's going to behave right now. If you have business logic and both. An example of this is like garbage collection. When the server introduces garbage collection, 
but the old versions of CLI still thought that they had to do child reaping. If you use a skewed version of the client with a different version of the server, now they both think they're supposed to be doing this garbage collection piece. And it ended up causing um, just weird behaviors uh, that caused things to break a little bit. So we had to tell our users, don't use version 1.3 to control with version 1.4 server if you're doing this command because it breaks things, right? Um, so, but, but, but we have more than just kube control as the client. So it okay. feels like okay, if we fix this issue for kube control, are we gonna, are we just sort of kicking the can down the road and we're just ignoring the issue for all sorts of other well, actually, No, actually, so the, the point would be that by moving it to the server, all the other clients besides kube control get better. So for instance, reaping, was horribly painful for both dashboard and like other web consoles people have written because they had to implement it themselves. Yeah, yeah. and so that's, I, you know, that's the type of thing that makes sense there. Um, I don't know, I, I just feel like, I feel like if we do it client side, you have this issue where you don't have consistency across clients, but you also have um, the ability to, to, you know, you know, support multiple versions, be much more flexible about sort of like which ones you want to activate. It, it just feels to me like, like there's a lot more, there's a lot more sort of freedom on client side to do stuff. And once you actually put it into the server, you're kind of like locked in for life. It, I can kind of think as a concrete example, we're taking things that have already been done client side and are ready to move to the server side okay. and moving them to the server side. You're right. We probably wouldn't, and I don't think anything on Philip, your list was something that hasn't already been in a client that someone else than another client has wanted to go. I mean, like apply is a great example. Actually, I, so apply, I'm not going to rat hole here. The whole three-way merge with apply, I think is actually, <laughs> that was a yeah, I, I've been ranting on that lately, but that's a separate issue. That's, I'll, I'll take it up in the SIG meeting. <laughs> yeah, so I think that's a good point. We should, we should make sure that we're moving the right things from the client to the server. Okay, cool. Awesome. So I will ask um, a question, which is when you, did you as a group go through the questions that we had laid out around stabilization before doing this? And do you want to touch on those or not as not as closely as some of the other groups had? Um, we did go through the questions on stabilization. I think we've filled out some piece. Um, so uh, sorry, were you asking to kind of talk about how this lines up with the stabilization piece? Well, just uh, how it lines up with what answers did you get from the the varying questions that, you know, included, where did they go? Does your SIG own code? Where is it reflected in the owner's file? Do you spend enough time, too much time answering issues on GitHub, Stack Overflow? Balancing between new features and stabilization. How have you done over the last couple of releases? The, the introspection questions. Test code think, covered. Yeah, I think those are actually all things we've been talking about. Awesome. Already, um, some of this stuff we're well aware of, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and we've been working on stabilization for past releases. Like this last release was a big focus on kube control apply, mm -hmm. fixing bugs there, um, and that's going to continue to be the the case for next quarter. Uh, issues. That was also another thing. I think independently we talked about how, like, how do how do we manage issues and what are our goals around tackling them. So I think it lined up really well. But the the questions were useful to provide a framework. Good, 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 good. Yeah, the, the idea with them is exactly that. It's a framework to have you know relatively consistent discussions across the different special interest groups. So thank you. Do any other SIGs want to volunteer to talk about the 2017 planning, Q1 planning, or answers to those um, introspective questions that we set forward? Um, hey, this is Bob. Um, not fully, but one of the topics that's been coming up uh, last year and this year in SIG scaling is the etcd 3 um, migration, and I just wanted to call everyone's attention to that note that Tim Tim sent to Kubernetes dev. I think this is this is one we're pretty excited to see get pushed over the line for one six. Uh, that's awesome. So we did have a note in notices here of etc three is now enabled by default. etcd three is now enabled by default. I thought that was coming in one six, not one five. 
Right. No, I'm just, uh, this is just a one six, one, one six PSA. I just wanted to call everyone's attention to it, especially given that, that this has been, like I said, a, a six scaling uh, topic for quite some time. So. And I see also a request to help uh, with the etcd Kubernetes documentation. There's also uh, Yeah, I can talk about that one now, later oh. or now. Go for it. Yeah, um, so uh, the uh, etcd team, uh, hi, I'm Caleb from uh, CoreOS. Uh, so the etcd team would like to help uh, with improving the documentation about deploying and operating uh, etcd in the Kubernetes context. And so we have put together a uh, Google form to collect responses to uh, try and see how people are deploying uh, etcd for Kubernetes today and what uh, topics you'd like us to address in documentation. Um, so I also sent out a mailing uh, uh, post to the Kubernetes dev mailing list um, with a target uh, of getting collecting responses within uh, two weeks. So uh, please click that um, and fill out uh, responses if you deploy etcd for uh, Kubernetes, which if you're deploying Kubernetes, that's uh, everyone. <laughs> it's true. And if you've tried 1.6 and etcd3, it's even more helpful. All right, uh, so any other special interest groups want to update or share some of the 2017 planning? Really hard to say 2017. Sorry, I'm not gonna let uh, the NCD comment go without uh, uh, showering an enormous amount of compliments on um, CoreOS and all the great work they've done. Uh, it is very difficult to overstate the level to which this improvement in NCD makes um, our scaling goals for Kubernetes possible. So uh, really enormous compliments to them uh, and Daniel on, on our team who's helped integrate that. So uh, enormous amount of work. Please do uh, take note because it is awesome. Yes. CoreOS is a fantastic uh, core set of contributors to Kubernetes as are many of our partners, but around etcd, etcd specifically, that's, that's been a huge help. All right. Any other SIGs? No? Yes, we all heard the CoreOS team. Um, all right, so then I will go open the floor to other topics, which may or may not have been on our agenda, because we have a little bit of extra time today. So I had two questions that I <clears throat> put on the agenda there. Um, okay. The first was around a moratorium that Brian Grant posed over the holidays on um, feature and design proposal reviews. Uh, the idea was, since everybody's out for the holidays, let's not bother um, <clears throat> coming up with a process for uh, design proposal. And, um, there still seemed to be some like moving of documents from the Kubernetes repo to the community repo. Uh, so we figured it was easiest to like let the dust settle. Um, so it's now 2017. Um, my question is whether or not we want to open that up and start actually reviewing design proposals or if, it want, if we wanted it to keep going. And the only reason I bring up keep going is because Brendan Burns just sort of responded to the thread that I linked in the meeting notes and he's proposing that we sort of freeze design proposals for the entirety of this release since this is a stabilization release and theoretically anybody who wanted their feature in should have already gotten it in by now. Um, I personally believe that's a little unfair and maybe a larger discussion that should be had within the Kubernetes PM group, but I just wanted to um, ask the group here if anybody was aware that this was going on and, and like if we have an opinion on what we should do next. And to be clear, I was proposing that I wasn't <laughs> I was proposing the discussion, not uh, not that it should be the way it is. And, and and Clayton just chatted in that there are design proposals for things like stabilization. So I think that if we're if what you're talking about, maybe we should make a distinction between internal and external design proposals. Right? If you're talking about how we stabilize some internal piece of the API surface that no person is ever going to see, that's probably just fine. Well, so I'll, I'll try and be clear here. I guess I, I view the path to the path to 1.6 is if you want something new in 1.6, you need to open a feature issue. If you want to open a feature issue, one of the first things you need to do is have a design proposal that you can link that feature issue to. So you can describe the design of the feature you want to actually implement. And so 
if we put a roadblock on that, we put a roadblock on all new features going into one six, right? Yeah, I, I actually would, I think that's the, that would be the goal, right? Is I don't think that if we're doing stabilization, why are we building new features? So this is an interesting, uh, Brendan, I think one of the things that's interesting is, you know, listening in on a bunch of the SIGs talking about this, a few of the SIGs felt that they had already paid down a lot of their stabilization debt. And I think some of them reported that back here. I mean, do you, do you feel that a blanket statement across the SIGs makes sense? Or is this more of like, we should bias towards not features? Or do you think no features is important? Uh, I, I guess bias would be my, my statement. I guess my experience is that in the absence of saying absolutely not, then people slip everything in. And if you say absolutely not, then the people who really care and really think it's important come to you and ask for, you know, well, but this, like, just like you said, well, like there are some stabilization, you know, there are some stabilization proposals. Okay, well, that makes sense, right? Like, let's, let's, let's figure out the internals of how we restructure something. Or, you know, co if there's a proposal for how we build the new abstraction into the API codex so that that code isn't so, isn't so much of a nightmare, that's great, right? Um, but I think that we should be very careful about just opening the door to features because we won't do the stabilization work in that context. I guess this is Derek. I think for SIG node and for both SIG auto scaling, um, part of the goal of this release was to unblock things that had been long held held up. And so at least for those two SIGs, I'm aware of proposals that if we just do a blanket shutdown of proposals, I think we would miss valuable work. So I guess I'm kind of against the it, yeah. if it's been if it's been that long waiting, why is there not an already done proposal? Uh, it's more like uh, well if we talk about the monitoring pipeline, right? Like the monitoring pipeline was discussed for over a year and now we're down to the details of how we're actually going to do the monitoring pipeline. And so like the core metrics proposal that I think David just opened or like the custom metrics API client API that like Sally on my team opened, but like the number of things that like the high level vision have been discussed, but now you get down to the details that require designs. And I, I, I think a blanket statement project wide is misguided. Yeah, I mean, and we have, we have design proposals like out, they're just not merged yet they're still kind of in discussion or or nearing kind of that discussion merge time so it would i feel like it would kind of be a shame if we like you know we've gotten all this stuff going and then well, well we can't merge any design proposals now so well that's gonna have to wait for the next release even though you know we were getting close to consensus and so maybe on the on the if we're biased towards stabilization the that the, what you're describing, Derek and Solly, is the idea of long running things that are that were never single release kind of ticket features. I mean, I don't know, Brendan, was that a feature, the same kind of feature that you were thinking about? No, I think that that makes sense. I mean, I think that if I mean, I guess I would be okay with saying like if it's if it's in flight and you can demonstrate it's been in flight for a long time and it's been and it's just hasn't merged and you're just waiting for the three last checkoffs and there's nothing there is no big discussion still open, then that makes total sense. Like I don't want to stop work that is nearly done arbitrarily. But what I'm saying is that perhaps it is a time to stop the or I mean you can even continue the discussions, I guess, but but not come to new conclusions that we didn't already basically understand all, if that makes sense. I don't know, I feel like I'm being sort of vague. Maybe like this is a question for the SIGs, like in the SIG, are the things that you're proposing to do in one six brand new continuations of what has been worked on for a long time or stabilizing and fixing problems that are outstanding? And if you don't feel that if, if you can't clearly articulate that the things that you've already, you've already stabilized and you've already burned down your debt and you don't have debt, then you really don't have any, then it, there should be a very strong guidance against introducing any new concepts. Um, I, got, I think, I'm yeah, I think that's a good. list of Kubernetes SIG node features that we went through in our last SIG meeting and a number of these things. First off, we have certain, we have certain, release goals that are purely on getting design agreement. And so if there's just a release goal to get a design agreement, then someone needs to go and write a design. So I don't want to punish people for writing a design if that was an explicit goal to release. 
Um, then we have other features like coming through here, like Core Metrics API, disk space as a first class of resource type, product ID based disk quota. We have a number of items that I, I believe should deserve uh, design work around it. And these are additive to the rollout of existing things that had been in flight that we as a SIG were looking to tackle. So I think I, I would leave this up to the individual SIGs to manage. Yeah, I think it's tricky though, right? I mean, our EDE testing is is on its way back towards being catastrophically flaky, right? You can tell, I can tell. Like every single PR I put in now flakes. It wasn't that way two months ago, and in another two months it will be back like it was in, you know, six months ago, and, and that cycle has continued over and over again, right? And I think there's a degree to which, I mean, I understand that the SIGs think that they have stabilized and done all these sorts of things, and they may have, and it's hard to, but we, we, we have to maybe, there's a cost that we maybe need to incur across everything just to make sure that we do the right thing for the entire project. I think it's a really good point, Brennan. Like, it's the idea that we're, we've devolved the SIGs to be more independent. SIGs are creating roadmaps and publishing them. And so the SIGs have more autonomy. And yet we still need to be able to sound the alarms across the whole project and get, you know, make sure that that focus is there to, like, stabilization as a goal, um, ensuring that the EDEs don't slide as a goal, documentation as a goal, contributor access is a goal some of the cross-cutting concerns it's easy to lose sight of those when we go through roadmap um, in this at the stick level and i and i would say that like everything like this there's going to be waste right like i have to I think you have to freely admit like there will be places where it just is stupid but you have to do it in a cross-cutting way or else it just doesn't happen okay. and i don't know i think we should have the discussion and probably this is not the right context because it was you know something I emailed to the list rather than something that, that we put on the schedule. Just for clarity though, Vernon, is, is the idea that you don't want people creating yeah. PRs with designs, that you don't want those PRs to merge, that you don't want forward facing discussion to occur, or just that you don't want the features to be implemented? I, I think what I would like is I would like to ensure that everyone's primary attention is on stabilization. Right. So like, I mean, I, I always make the distinction between when I'm talking to people who I work for or who, who, who I've worked with, there's a distinction between like on the clock time and YouTube time, right? Like I think we all go and watch YouTube some of the time. And if you want to go work on design proposals in your YouTube time, instead of watching YouTube, that's great. Right. But we need to understand. And also, but also we have to understand that that comes at a cost, right? Like, especially it, and it really depends, right? Some things, if they're going to stay entirely inside of a SIG, maybe it doesn't cost the entire project. But, but some things cost the entire project because people need to learn about it, right? And need to understand it. Um, and that costs work that might otherwise be headed towards stabilization. Um, so that, that, that's, my, that's my sense is it's, we want to make sure that the focus and the effort and is, is there. And I think there's opportunity for things to slip. So if I'm a new developer to the project and I have a new idea and I want to submit a new design, it's up to me to figure out which SIG I should get to review that design. And then I should figure out if that SIG has paid down enough tech debt to know if they're going to be able to allocate a reviewer. No, in that, in that context, I'd say, I'm sorry, one six is closed. Personally, I don't think that if you're a new developer with a new idea, I don't think that this is going to be the right release. I mean, there's nuance there, right? Like if you have one flag with one feature for a standard out in cube control, like, that might not even warrant a design proposal. That might just be a PR, right? Like, I think there's a, there, there is a little bit of nuance there, but I think that we, part of this is, is, is not putting in new stuff and, not, and new bugs. I suppose I agree with that in principle. I, I guess my thought was that's what the feature freeze date was for, was to sort of mandate that by a date, like I think two or three weeks from now, we say what's definitely happening and what's definitely not. I think there's a distinction between stabilizing a release, which is something we do every release, and a stabilization release, which is a release that is entirely, it, it, like. I'm trying to use one mechanism to track what's going into this release, and at the moment, it's been the features repo. I'm concerned that what you're talking about is there's work ongoing that's not covered by the features repo because it's not user-facing, but it is stabilization. And this may make it tougher to figure out what is actually being worked on and why. I think there's always work like that, right? Like there's always figure, you know, finding races and finding like, 
that's just the way that development works. I don't know. I, I think we might be rat holing it, so maybe we should let other people. We we are, and I apologize. I'm the I'm the jerk who brought this up while Brian Grant's not here, and I think this maybe falls under the purview of a, a discussion primarily led by the contributor experience working group, possibly, or maybe the Kubernetes PM working group. If we're talking about what goes into the release. Um, so uh, six, six storage. We just had our uh, planning meeting this morning, and. Um, a lot of the features that we were discussing were continuations on existing features, but a couple of them were uh, brand new features, things like snapshots. Um, so we would love to get some guidance on whether we're uh, proposing absolutely no features or not. We feel like we've paid down a lot of technical debt uh, in the past few quarters, and we're ready to uh, start pumping out new features. But if as uh, Kubernetes as in general needs to pump the brakes and focus on stabilization, uh, we'd like to get that signal sooner rather than later. Let's do this on the mailing list, right? I mean, as I said before, this was an idea spit to the mailing list, not not a conclusion. So, like, let's just talk and and get that done. And if there's enough discussion, if there's enough discussion there, then maybe next meet community meeting we can spend more time on it. And so, and, I think we've always said that moving things from alpha to beta or beta to GA counts as stabilization work and counts as moving moving this in the right direction without adding new features. So I think the question okay. is really only around the are new features. Your new features. Correct. Awesome. I, I think, and I think there's broad agreement that anything massive that's net new, like to Brian's original point, like there's been a lot of design backlog. The more we can try to reduce the number of new concepts coming in, um, the easier it is to ensure the existing concepts get time and attention. And so even just like on a feature basis, if it's a net new feature and it's not dramatically reducing the cognitive complexity of something else, it's probably in, or, uh, uh, increasing the cognitive complexity of everything else and it's going to cause more problem. Yeah, and I think that's my basic point. I mean, I think there's also a degree to which what you're saying is effectively like those are stabilization features for the API. Right? Like if you're reducing the cognitive debt, then in some way you are stabilizing the API. That's Whereas right. if you are increasing the cognitive debt, you're destabilizing the API. Cool. Okay. Well, more discussion on the mailing list. Um, my other quick question, and again, we can probably have this on the mailing list, is it seems as though um, some of the team names have changed on GitHub. I don't know if you've noticed how like SIG scalability doesn't exist anymore, but SIG scalability MISC does. Um, and I'm gathering, if I look at the teams that were created for SIG on-prem, there's an intent to create a whole bunch of teams per SIG. And I am assuming that that work is, is ongoing, but I'm having difficulty finding um, where it's tracked. And I, I believe there was a, a mail sent across either the contributor experience mailing list or the Kubernetes dev mailing list that maybe laid out a proposal for the labels, but I don't, I can't find like an issue or a, a pull request to link to, to refer to for like what the plan is. So A, am I the only person who's noticed and B, does anybody know what's going on? I think uh, were... I was the, per yes. Yes, so I was the person who made it. So we've been we've been talking to Brian Grant, who decided to implement the current situation with the C groups. So answering your question, where is the discussion and uh, where is uh, where is the commit of pull request for that? All the stuff is in the community repo. There is a pull request number two to six, so you can open it and read all the information there. And we can link it into the notes as well. Yeah, I will link it to, to the notes. So it's a pull request with reference to the uh, discussion that uh, has happened in Kubernetes Dev mailing list. So if you have any extra question, please follow, follow this discussion and ask them. Awesome, thank you. Any other questions or commentary or things we should bookmark for discussion at a later date? Topic. Um, what was, so you, you mentioned last meeting and then at the beginning of this meeting about SIG leads hosting the, uh, hosting the meetings. I yep. couldn't remember if you had mentioned how we were determining which SIG leads were hosting when. Is it volunteer? Is it pseudo random number generators? <laughs> so what I'm going to do is build out a spreadsheet because PGMs love spreadsheets. 
and I will set up dates and start by asking volunteers. And then if we don't get volunteers early enough and um, include, you know, having good coverage, then I will start assigning dates and then you can horse trade your way out of the date you're assigned to. Um, but we will, this is going to be a thing that I will send a broader set of instructions to the Kubernetes uh, SIG leads mailing list. So there's nothing to be done yet, Sully, you're all set. And thank you for volunteering immediately. That was awesome. Yeah, I, I was going to. <laughs> yeah, I'm going. I suspected. Um, but if, right. you, if you and cool. if you want to help me and do next week, we can we can set up the rest. I can get the rest of it out um, and the the email sent so that we have a broad idea and you can be my guinea pig. How about that? All right. Sounds good. Fantastic. All right, so that's the uh, continuing of the community mailing or community meeting. Any other things? Otherwise, I'll go through a last couple of notices. All right, I will go through notices. Jump in if you uh, have something else. So two-factor authentication is going to be required if you are a Kubernetes org member um, by the end of the month. So please turn on 2FA. Um, if you don't have it on when we enable 2FA across the, the entire organization, you will be kicked out of the organization, which means you can still do pull requests and such um, against the code base, but you will lose some of the privileges like labeling, if I remember correctly, and other, other fun things. Uh, so that's one. I talked about the PM group meeting, um, and there are links to the time and agenda in the notes. Uh, also. Planning has begun on the Kubernetes Leadership Summit, which is a new thing, which is going to happen, I believe, at DockerCon. We don't have confirmed rooms yet, but once we get there, I will, I will bring this out. So the Leadership Summit is going to be primarily SIG leads and team leads from the companies that, um, that are, are uh, large-scale contributors. So we will be generating an invite list for that. Um, and that will be happening, as I said, likely in Austin at or around DockerCon, either the day before or the day after. As soon as I have um, facilities, we will nail that down. We also have started the 2017 Kubernetes Developer Summit planning, which will also be in Austin, but at KubeCon in November. Um, same, same game, I will try to find a day before or a day after. Uh, the KubeCon, and as soon as we can get our facilities nailed down on that, we will let you all know for planning purposes. We talked a little bit about SCD3 in 1.6 and the SCD user survey. Uh, anyone else with things that you want to um, that you want to either give as notices or topics in discussion, or we'll get out a little bit early today. Um, I hopped on the call a little late, but uh, update on 1.5. Uh, we're planning on uh, releasing 1.5.2 on Tuesday, uh, December 10th. There were a bunch of patches that went in over the holidays. Um, after that, I'm planning on handing off the 1.56 uh, release our duties to someone else. Uh, at the moment, this process is still very Google-centric, so it's going to be someone we'll select from Google. Uh, but moving forward, I think that discussion's already happened. 1.6 is going to be led by, uh, by, by Dan, um, and uh, hopefully the 1.6x could be somebody who's not from Google as well. Excellent. Progress, slowly but surely, always. All right, anyone else with topics? Thank you for the update, Saad. All right, well, we get 11 minutes of our life back. And thank you all for discussing all the awesome that is Kubernetes and Happy New Year. See you all next week when Solly leads.